benzodiazepines were first brought on the market in the early 1960s. And originally, we felt these were wonder drugs. What we discovered very soon was it was a kind of fool's gold. That the risks of the drugs, the harms done by them, were much greater than the benefits. There is no benzodiazepine that doesn't carry these risks. So in the first years of my psychiatric practice, these were seen as great drugs. They were remarkably useful in, with psychotic patients, and it was just the beginning of the antipsychotic treatments for uh, people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. They seemed remarkably helpful with schizophrenic bipolar patients. They were wonderfully helpful with people with anxiety disorders, and they seemed like a terrific way of getting people off alcohol, that they would substitute the benzodiazepines for alcohol. The people who seemed to be getting off alcohol and onto benzos often began using both together. That people who got benzos for anxiety uh, got, in the long run, more anxiety because once hooked, they couldn't withdraw from the medicine. They still have some use in the short term with people with psychosis, uh, but in the long run, they're not helpful in curing psychotic symptoms and often result in an added addiction. So what seemed like remarkable benefit turned very quickly into remarkable harms. And that history mirrors the history with each new patient. The benzo seemed very helpful for the first month, but then in the long run, they no longer have a beneficial effect, and they have a very harmful effect on the person's life. Very often, the general practitioner prescribes the uh, benzodiazepine, thinking that the person will take a very small dose for a very short period of time, and it will tide them over. However, people, once they begin starting the medicine, discover that it does relieve their anxiety at the moment, but then hours later the anxiety recurs, sometimes even stronger, because there's a withdrawal component. Tolerance means gradually taking more of the medicine, more frequently during the day, in higher doses. And some people experience withdrawal even when they're taking the medicine as prescribed because they're developing tolerance that the same effect that they had on a particular dosage earlier is no longer present, that they need to take more and more medicine and need to take it more and more frequently. And then generally, after several weeks or months, they become hooked. There is really no psychiatric indication that makes it worthwhile to start a benzodiazepine. That whatever gain you might get in the few weeks after beginning the medicine in reducing anxiety, the risks are overwhelmingly um, so, so terrible that really no one should be given a benzodiazepine by a GP or by a psychiatrist for anxiety, just not worth the risk. However, here's the problem. The benzodiazepines in the short run calm people down. It's a wonderful feeling. You were anxious before, pop a pill, you feel better. So it's the easiest way to get a happy patient out of the office to give them a benzodiazepine prescription. The purpose of the pharmaceutical industry is to make profits, not to help people. And they were no longer making profits from the early benzodiazepines, Librium and Valium, because they were off patent. In the mid-80s, um, Upjohn developed Xanax in a brilliant research and marketing strategy, gathering together researchers from all over the world, 
in a massive effort to legitimize Xanax as a new, much safer and better benzodiazepine. I actually saw some of the data in um, 1986, I think it was, on Xanax, and it was clear that the dose required for treating panic disorder was already an addicting dose. That the company had to know, because it was obvious from the data, that if there were to be benefits in treating panic disorder, the price you would pay would be addiction to their product. Now, from their point of view, patients becoming addicted is not such a bad thing. It means they have to take it on and on in bigger and bigger doses for forever, maybe, for many years or forever. But it was clear from the very beginning to me, seeing the, the, the uh, research, that Xanax was going to be the problem it eventually became. There is no benzodiazepine that doesn't carry these risks. Taking benzos is a lot like drinking, similar effects on the brain. And so the, the cognitive deficits that someone can have from becoming a young alcoholic, they can also have being a young benzo-dependent um, person. Um, it can affect the performance in school, on the job. It's devastating in terms of driving. People can be as impaired with benzos driving as they would be with alcohol. So all of the side effects that you associate with alcohol in young people can also occur with benzos. Here's the amazing thing. The group that's getting the most benzos are the very people who are most vulnerable to their harmful effects, the elderly. An elderly person going to a doctor is three times more likely to get a prescription of a benzo than a younger person, even though the benzos cause terrible, devastating side effects in the elderly. These include confusion, memory loss, delirium. It often looks like the person's demented when really it's just the fact that they've been on a benzo. The first thing I ask any elderly person who's having any cognitive problem is what medicine they're on. And very often the cognitive problem is being caused by a benzo. The very best thing you can do to improve cognitive functioning in elderly people is to very often take them off the benzo they've been taking. The benzos also cause falls. The way most of us will die is via a fall. That's usually the beginning of the end in people's lives. And benzos promote falling. So there couldn't really be a worse thing to be giving an elderly patient, really anyone, than a medicine that may cause confusion, memory lapses, um, delirium, and, and um, disorientation, and falls. And yet that's what's happening in our country. Most people presenting to a GP for anxiety have a short-term stressor that's making them feel terrible. Most of the symptoms will go away in most people within a few weeks or a month. This can be assisted with counseling, uh, psychotherapy, uh, helping to figure out what's causing the stress and finding solutions to the stress, support from the family, and natural resilience. No matter how badly a person feels today, they're likely to feel better tomorrow. For someone who's not taken benzos, I would go to great lengths to convince them never to do it. That's not a good idea. To someone who's already physiologically dependent on benzos, there's a difficult question. And that is whether to undergo the rigors of a carefully medically monitored withdrawal, which in the long run will bring them great benefit, or whether they feel that it is just too difficult for them to um, embrace. And I think that's a matter of, of, of personal preference on the patient's part. I don't think the doctor can tell someone, you must withdraw from these benzodiazepines, uh, because the, the problems in, that follow from that are, 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 are so extreme. But on the other hand, I would be strongly encouraging everyone who's physiologically dependent that it's worth the try, and that I'd be there with them. So if they put their heart into it, I will put my heart into it. We'll do it very, very slowly. We'll follow their lead to how slowly it has to be. And even if it takes months or maybe a year or more, it's worth the price.